let's start with heteroscedasticity. If the assumption that the variance of the residuals is constant across observations holds, the standard deviation of the residuals should be the same if we segregate the observations into subgroups. When the variance of the residuals is not the same across the different subgroups, the observations exhibit heteroscedasticity. Unconditional heteroscedasticity occurs when the heteroscedasticity is not related to the level of the independent variables, which means that it doesn't systematically increase or decrease with changes in the value of the independent variable. While this is still a violation of the equal variance assumption, it usually causes no major problems with the regression. Conditional heteroscedasticity is heteroscedasticity that's related to the level of the independent variables. For example, conditional heteroscedasticity exists if the variance of the residual term increases as the value of the independent variable increases as shown. Conditional heteroscedasticity does create significant problems for statistical inference. Why so? Now here's a chance for you to think critically. Given that the observations used in the regression exhibit conditional heteroscedasticity, how do you think it affects the accuracy of the estimates of the coefficient and the estimates of its standard error? Firstly, the coefficient estimate should not be affected by heteroscedasticity. This is because the slope of the regression line is not affected by the variance of the errors. However, the accuracy of the standard error of the coefficient will be affected by heteroscedasticity. You do not need to know exactly how the standard error of the coefficient is derived, but do know that it's a function of the SEE. So if it happens that majority of the observations made have a low x value, the variance of the errors may be underestimated. This implies that the SEE is underestimated, which means that the standard error of the coefficient is underestimated. Since the coefficient is the denominator in the calculation of the t-statistic, and we mentioned earlier that the estimate of the coefficient is unaffected, the t-statistic will be too large. Because of that, the null hypothesis of no statistical significance is rejected too often. Likewise for the f-test, MSE is underestimated, so the f-statistic is too large. This also means that the null hypothesis of no statistical significance is rejected too often. This can imply that there are too many type 1 errors. If the pattern of heteroscedasticity is in the opposite direction, that is, if the majority of observations have high x values, we reverse all our arguments. Both the t-statistic and f-statistic will be too small, meaning that the null hypothesis is rejected too seldom. In this case, there can be too many type 2 errors. So as you can see, heteroscedasticity can cause unreliable conclusions with regard to the statistical significance of an independent variable. Therefore, it's important to be able to detect and correct heteroscedasticity. One very straightforward way to detect heteroscedasticity is to examine the scatter plot of the residuals, which is to plot the errors against the independent variable of interest. A visual examination will help you determine if the data exhibits heteroscedasticity. However, sometimes this can be complicated by individual judgment. The more objective method is the broich pagan test, which has a chi-square distribution with k degrees of freedom. The null hypothesis is that the data is not heteroscedastic, while the alternate is that the data is heteroscedastic. And the test statistic is calculated as follows, where n and k are as usual, the number of observations and the number of independent variables respectively. Do take note that the r squared of the residuals is from the second regression of the squared residuals, not the first regression. Don't worry, you will not be asked to calculate this as it is a common output from statistical software. Also, remember that this is a one-tailed test because heteroscedasticity is only a problem if the R squared and the BP test statistic are too large. As usual, we derive the critical value from the chi-squared distribution table and if the test statistic falls inside the rejection region, we reject the null hypothesis. This means that the data exhibit significant heteroscedasticity. Let's illustrate with an example. 
you perform a linear regression to forecast the quarterly return of TSI index based on Tinyland's GDP growth and change in interest rates used in the last three years of quarterly data. The R squared of the regression is 0.76. You regress again the squared errors of the data and calculated an R squared of 0.54. Perform a BP test at 5% level of significance to determine if the data exhibits heteroscedasticity. Pause the video now and work out your answer. And we're back. First, we define the null hypothesis that the data is not heteroscedastic. The alternate is therefore the opposite. Next, we look for the critical value using the chi-square table, but before that, we need to determine the degrees of freedom, which is the number of independent variables. We can observe two independent variables in the regression, GDP growth and change in interest rates. We are also asked to perform the test at 5% level. That is, we want the area to the right to be 5%. Our critical value is therefore 5.991. And finally, we calculate the test statistic, which is n times the r squared of the residuals. We're given 2 r squared, so make sure you pick the one on the squared errors, which is 0.54. Also, be clear that n is 3 times 4, as there are 4 quarters in a year. Our test statistic is therefore 6.48. Since our test statistic is higher than the critical value, we reject h naught. This means that the data exhibits heteroscedasticity. You're watching an excerpt from our comprehensive animation library. For more videos like these, head on down to prepnuggets.com. At Prep Nuggets, let us do the hard work for you.